Welcome to the Tales of a Red Clay Rambler podcast, featuring interviews with culture makers from around the world. This is Ben Carter. I'm going to be your host. If you'd like more information on the show, please visit our website, talesofaredclayrambler.com. Welcome back to episode 383 of the podcast. Thank you guys for tuning in. Today on the show, I talk with Renee Lepresti. From her studio in San Marcos, Texas, she makes vibrant pottery that has layers of three-dimensional patterning. In our interview, we talk about how she develops the motifs that she uses in her surface design, as well as how she determines price after spending hours and hours making the pots that she does. If you'd like to see examples of her work, you can go to her website. That's ReneeLaPrestiCeramics.com. You can also follow her on Instagram under the same name. Before we get to that, I wanted to thank the folks that donated to our spring fund drive. We are listener supported, so I'd like to thank Elaine Brewer-White and Althea Jonik for their recent contributions. If you'd like to get involved yourself, you can do that a few ways. The first is that you could become a sustaining member on Patreon. For that, you'll have access to t-shirts and all sorts of other perks, including the Tales from the Vault podcast feed, which features shows that are no longer available through major podcast apps. You can also make a one-time donation through the PayPal portal on the website. That's talesofaredclayrambler.com slash donate. Without further ado, we'll get to the interview. Yeah, I thought we would start talking about your aesthetic and and some of the motifs that you use in your work. I was specifically thinking about cats, which I was looking at a, a pot of yours, and there's this image of a cat sitting on a chair looking into a mirror. So can you talk about how you got to that motif and what that means for you as a symbol? Um, I will say that the cats originally started out a lot more simple in the sense that um, I was creating these scenes with paper planes flying and crashing and there were chairs. I originally just thought there was this narrative going on between the chairs and the paper airplanes, but um, it was all these inanimate objects. And I kept thinking what would happen if I introduced a living creature and started thinking about how things change when there's an observer, which I kind of draw a correlation to that, to like the saying of, of a tree falls in the woods, nobody's there to hear it, doesn't make a sound. And also quantum physics, how like particles can behave differently when they're being observed. So these are just some of the things that I was thinking about when I introduced them. And so originally it was just the observer of the situation and thinking about how that changed the dynamic of the meaning. Then the cat started changing into wanting to, like I was thinking about how I could have them interact with objects. And so the mirror for me was a lot of it's just sort of that existential, like who am I thing, even though it's a cat, it could represent us without actually depicting a human figure. There was something about it that just, I was drawn to without having a very specific story. A lot of times when I would be making, I would be sort of piecing together these narratives, but I didn't know exactly what the meaning was going to be. I would think of multiple scenarios. I would think, oh, it could, you know, it could be that this cat's looking in the mirror and then there's another cat on the other side that's sort of looking out into the distance. And it could be about this relationship where, you know, the one person is trying or just one being is trying to reach out to someone else, but but they're not really there. Um, Maybe they're too self-involved or trying to discover themselves. You know, I would just think of lots of different scenarios that could mean, and I would play with that. And I found that really intriguing that it could be open for interpretation. Yeah. It's just sort of, that was the way that I would play with images because I developed this language um, in which everything sort of could exist together in the same sort of narrative or scene. And then they just became these components that I would play with. 
And yeah, the mirror is definitely the one that stuck the longest because I think about self-reflection a lot. You know, as, as potters, we spend a lot of time in the studio alone, thinking not only about the work, but where we've come from, where we're going. Um, it just leads, leaves a lot of time for that sort of deep dive, self-exploration, introspection. And I love the idea of an animal looking in a mirror as being a representation of us. And when we think about how often we notice our appearance and change our appearance, it is something I think that differentiates humans versus other types of animals. So sometimes I've seen dogs, you know, they look at themselves in a mirror and then they bark because they think it's another dog. Like it's not a, there's no concept that it, it is themselves. Right. It's interesting that we are, are sometimes like obsessed with our appearance. <laughs> Especially this day and age, you know, there's times I think about, you know, what was the world like before mirrors? Like the only time you would maybe see yourself would probably be like looking into water. Like if you happen to be near a puddle or a lake, <laughs> like if you didn't like what, how many reflective surfaces are there in nature? I was thinking about like metal when you were saying that you could shine metal, but metal is expensive. So I don't think mirrors are that old relative to human evolution. You know, like we've been, we've been conscious beings way, way longer than mirrors. So there's something about you putting the cat in that where I automatically thought, oh yeah, that's a human, even though it's a cat, <laughs> like mm -hmm. she's telling us that story. So can you talk about how you use self-reflection? We can jump away from the work just for a second, how you use self-reflection as a way to make your person better, like to become a better human, not necessarily a better potter. Sometimes I think I'm a little bit too nostalgic, um, where I sort of ruminate about the past. And it can be spurred a lot of times if I'm in the studio and there's like this one radio station I get that's like all the hits from 1970s to now. <laughs> and there's songs that everybody's heard, but music can just throw you back to that time and a place where you know, it's like, oh, this is when I was in high school and I was working at a deli and, <laughs> you know, it just takes <laughs> me right back. And then from that, I will start thinking about just these past experiences. And some of them, some of them are, are in longing and nostalgia, but some of them are also like, I wasn't really so proud of that thing that I did. You know, how have I grown and what could I do better? I think that's just always a driving internal dialogue. What could I do better? You know? not only for myself personally, but of course for the work, because it's so natural as humans, right? We always want to be progressing. And when we look back, think I'm better now. <laughs> I think about that a lot with people. I'm not going to name them, of course, but I've had friends that couldn't get out of their own way. You know, like their personal life is what kept them from being great in the studio. And it's always hard because I wanted to just like shake them by the shoulders and just be like, just, I mean, not that I know what they should do, but just work a little bit on your personal life so that it doesn't hold you back in the studio. And then there's the, the adverse or the opposite situation to that, which is focusing so much on the studio that it can affect your personal life. You know, I think that's where I'm at now. <laughs> I would say when I was in, when I was younger um, and I was in college, it was the opposite. I, I wasn't quite there yet. I didn't have that studio um, focus and drive. I was more in, like, I couldn't get it straight. <laughs> it sounds like the person you, like you're describing. I needed the shaking. And now it's just completely the opposite, where it takes a lot for me to get out of the studio. It's my little world. <laughs> and I think, you know, with the pandemic, it, it really made that even more so you know, because it was like the safe thing. Like, yeah, you want to go be in your bubble. <laughs> Encouraged. Yeah. Can you talk about your workflow? Like what's your average week like? Every day I go. <laughs> I'm, I'm an everyday person. I've been trying to figure out the weekend thing, but mm, it hasn't happened yet. I think I'm just a real busy body. So I have a hard time not doing anything. So yeah, I'll, I'll go to the studio. Um, typically, now it's an eight hour day. Sometimes I'll, you know, have a six hour day and cut out early. 
Um, and sometimes it's more depending on if there's a deadline. Yeah, I go to the studio and the actual day-to-day work, of course, varies. But um, I go in and I have, I've gotten really into plants. So now I have like over 70 plants in my little 120 square foot space. Wow. <laughs> and I check on them and get them, you know, see who needs a drink. And <laughs> it's like, you want water? You want water? No, you're good. Okay. And then, yeah, I just, I start on whatever it is. I work out of damp boxes a lot. Uh, so the plastic bins with the gasket seal and plaster in the bottom, because all my work, I throw quite a bit at a time, like 40 ish pieces, sort of whatever I have seven damp boxes. So whatever I can fit, fill them up. And then it'll take me weeks to get through that. So I'm usually decorating and working on surface. Yeah. Sometimes I make a list. Sometimes I don't. And yeah, I just, I go into my bubble and, and make. There's some images that I love of yours that were your trimming plants. Like there's a hand with scissors. It's not actually cutting, but it's more like the plant motif is beside it. And then the scissor is around it or above it. So can you talk about that as a metaphor, like this idea of trimming plants? That seems like a a rich thing to draw from. Yeah, sort of like the mirror motif. I see multiple meanings in it. Sometimes I see it as, oh, you know, is it is it hindering growth or stopping growth? Or is it actually encouraging growth? Because there's a lot of plants that once you prune them, it actually makes them come back much stronger. They branch and they come back fuller. And maybe the things that hinder our growth initially are the things that make us come back stronger. You know, just I think about metaphors like that a lot or just different takes on it. So that's kind of where my mind has been. Um, And then sometimes there'll be a bee in there. So, you know, you've got the pollinators and you've got sort of the gardener tending. And it's funny, I I have a garden going right now and I had um, yellow squash and they would get all these little tiny squashes. And um, I was just like, oh, this is great. They're doing so well. And then two days later, they would shrivel up and fall off. And I thought, that's so strange. This plant looks really healthy. I don't know why this is happening. And I looked it up and it's because they weren't getting pollinated. And there's just like a one day window where the female flowers open up. And if that pollen from the male flower doesn't get over, then it dies. The the fruit dies. And um, I'd have to go out there with a little tiny paintbrush. I had looked it up online and they're like, you can take the pollen from the male flower and then put it onto the female flower and like pollinate that way. Oh, wow. Yeah. It it felt so silly. (laughs) (laughs) But I just thought, oh my gosh, you know, can you imagine if all the bees were gone and this was, this had to be done for all of the produce? Like, what's your job? Oh, you know, um, I'm a pollinator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We don't think about how vital bees are in terms of large crops. So for instance, when I lived in California, they would drive bees from the South. Like they would drive Alabama bees all the way to California to pollinate the almond crop because the almond trees there's just there's just so much out there that they didn't they had bees but they didn't have enough bees so i was driving in tahoe one time and i literally saw these bees from alabama on the back of a truck in these big it was kind of weird to see bees in a container in that way and driving up to an elevation that they i don't think would naturally be at tahoe's pretty tall But then they would go back once they went over the mountains, they would go back down and, you know, I guess they, I don't know how that works because I don't, I find it hard to believe you can bring a bee from Alabama, pollinate something in California and drive those same bees back. You think just getting them back into their container or just like the actual shock of the shock of it in the lifespan. I guess I don't, I don't know that much about, I shouldn't say this. My mother-in-law is a, a beekeeper and she'll, <laughs> she'll <laughs> criticize me for not uh, knowing, but I don't, I don't know what the life cycle of a bee is. Me either. Maybe if they only brought them out there for two weeks, because a lot of plants, you know, that, that peak window is, is relatively small of flowering. So maybe it's just like a little vacation. <laughs> That's right. Everyone needs that California vacation every once in a while. <laughs> Let's go back to the paper airplane. That's something that you have, have used a good bit. There's something about a crashing 
or a, a paper airplane that has already flown that is so sad? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what does that symbol mean to you? Is, is it a symbol of sadness? It can be. <laughs> it's funny. I was using just the paper airplane for a while, and I kept coming back to this image um, that I remember from art history, and it was it was an advertisement for this wire Eames chair where they had like all these wire chairs stacked up. And then in the middle, there was this black bird. Does that ring a bell for you? you know, it doesn't. Oh, I'll have to share it with you. It's, it's okay. beautiful. Just all the crisscrossing of the, of those hard silhouettes created by the wire chairs. I just kept thinking about that and then taking these planes and thinking about how I could, it was very visual. It was like, an aesthetic choice initially. And so then I put it together. I remember making the first one and, and, and looking at it finished and thinking, Oh, that's, that's kind of (laughs) dark. And, you know, the feedback was great. And I'm just like, okay, I mean, there's something here. And it's really interesting. Now, when I look at it, it's not just always this dark thing. I think about just the natural ebb and flow of life and how there are times where we have our highs and there are times where we have our lows and so much of the good moments are elevated because of the lows we've been in, right? That like paradox, like in order to know bliss, you need to understand suffering sometimes or sadness in order to understand happiness. It's all about the, the relationship in order to, to understand each side of that. So sometimes I think of it as like, there's, there's a pile of crashed planes and then there's one soaring uh, nearby. There's one that's about to take a plunge. It's sort of like you're seeing the full cycle. And then I'll always, like, I have these little dashed lines that I'll do behind the plane just to show where they've been. But then I'll always have one. If you actually follow the dashed line, it'll go back to the pile. Like it's risen out of the pile but it's never like really overt. Like I don't have it so you can see it all from one angle. You'd have to turn the pot to be able to like trace that back. But I think about just the cycle and ebb and flow. How long when you're, when you use a a motif, does it take for you to understand it? Cause I I think you've mentioned, or maybe I'm interpreting this, that it's an intuitive process. Like you, you gather your motifs, you work with them for a while. And then how long do you work with them before you, develop them of what they mean to you? I think it varies. And sometimes there will be this idea initially, like it could happen the first time I'm using the motif, but I'm actually putting it on the pot, usually not in the design phase. That's more so just thinking about like um, formal elements, line weight and proportion and things like that. But once I actually start making the pots, that's when the ideas start flowing about what it could mean to me and to others. And then that process can evolve many times over. Every time I use that motif, I try to always think of something new. This what if, you know, what if it meant this? What if it meant that? Simple little Mm -hmm. things, but just really trying to explore all the different possibilities to derive meaning. And, And there are some times that there could be a motif that I've been using for a while and thought I had thought of every possibility as far as how I could interpret it. And then something new will happen because of what's going on maybe in my personal life or someone will share with me how, what it means to them that I never even thought of. That reflection back from the, the customer or the buyer, that's a really beautiful part of pots when you can sell a pot and it becomes a part of someone else's daily life. And then they, they kind of report back. <laughs> oh yeah. That's what it's all about. <laughs> It's wonderful. Can you talk about some of the plant-based motifs that you've been working with lately? There, I cannot, I cannot remember the name of the plant, but it's a broad leaf. It has a variegated surface. So it's, do you know which one I'm talking about? Oh, the Monstera. That. The variegated yes. Monstera. Yeah. Um, so I did the narrative work. I've done the narrative work for quite a few years now. You know, you mentioned the, the plants with the hands and the scissors I've done some bees and flowers. Uh, So the natural world or flowers were something that I, it was sort of like a second, I don't know, I guess, body of work 
or just second surface that I would always have going in conjunction with the narrative work. And for me, I always felt like that work was, it was just a little bit more free as far as how I could construct the surface. With the narrative work, I always felt like, okay, this is an interior setting. There needs to be a line that is like the ground. <laughs> so not everything's just floating in space. Um, and so I would build up these background layers that were blocks of color that would sort of hint at that this was in a room. And when I work with florals, I don't have to worry about any of that. It can be coming from the rim downward. It can, it can just go you know, anywhere. And so that's always been just a really wonderful way to focus a bit more on color choices, texture, pattern. And so lately I've been doing a lot more florals because I feel like I'm in a transition right now uh, with my process. I'm using a lot of the same materials, but the techniques are changing. And that's sort of a nice way to step back from the narrative work and some of the confines that I face when I'm making a surface and to be able to just freely explore the process. So I would say that narrative is not, there's not so much of an intent there as far as concept, but I'm working toward it. I think it's really fun, this idea of doing sort of a, maybe not a repeat pattern, pattern, but a, a pattern that is, reads as surface pattern design, which is, you know, sort of how a lot of textiles are treated as such, where there can be multiple motifs within the pattern, and then like an underlying theme or concept. Um, and it's not so linear as the like narrative work that I've done, where it's sort of like, it all exists on this one ground plane, and then you go around, it's almost like a comic book or comic cells in the way that it reads. So that's what I'm working toward. And right now the plants are allowing me to sort of figure out the kinks of the technology and the processes that I'm using. I'm getting pretty close to the point of bringing some narrative back into it. Let's talk process. Can you talk about how you start with an image and then how that becomes a frisket or a template that can be applied to the pot? I guess... I could talk a little bit about how I used to do it versus how I do it now. Sure. Um, for those with that are curious about this process, but maybe don't have access to the technology yet. So I have a die cutting machine and I cut all of my images out of vinyl. It's adhesive backed vinyl, but I don't actually use the adhesive because I do it on leather hard and damp clay and plastic just want to stick. So before I was using an iPad and doing digital drawings, I would either take a picture or find images online. And then I would like, like if it was like a silhouette of a cat, I would print out the picture and <laughs> cut out the cat and then put it on a piece of white paper and photograph it. <laughs> and then have a, like, I would do it so backwards and so <laughs> like low tech to high tech, but it was just the way my brain worked and what I knew. Or, I mean, sometimes you could, make it easier, you could find, you can do a search of like isolated cat and that will pull up only images of a cat on a white background where they photographed it that way. And then if you're dropping it into the program, it sees only contrast. So it's really only taking the silhouette. So that would be one way to do it. I would also draw on paper and pencil and then go back over it with like a felt tip, fine, sort of like a micron um, marker and then erase the pencil lines. And then I would have my black and white image and I would photograph it because I don't have a scanner <laughs> and drop that into the program. And yeah, it was difficult. It was difficult to get the line thickness right. If you make a mistake with the marker, it, it just, you know, you can think of plenty of shortcomings there. And now I have a iPad. So I do everything directly on the iPad and my sourcing is pretty much the same. I'll either take a photo or I will um, find some reference photos from online. And then from those, I can do all my drawing in a Procreate, which is one of the applications that you can get for the iPad. And it's basically like MS Paint, 
but like better. Like it's really approachable. It's not like Photoshop. It's wonderful. And so I'll just do everything in black and white as a digital drawing. And I can change sizing and scale very easily. If I make a mistake, you can, you know, it's just so forgiving or even for going back and reworking an image if you have to. And then I put it into the program that corresponds with the die cutter. And yeah, that's how I get it to be a die cut vinyl. Yeah. And you mentioned line quality when you were talking about the paper airplanes and the, the line quality is so crisp. Talk about the airplane or the scissors. It's, it's the same thing. Like when you have a tight geometric object, what is the way to get a thick enough line that it works with a vinyl cut template, but a thin enough line that it's aesthetically pleasing? A lot of that was trial and error for a while. There's a way to, when you're in the program, to sort of, like I found a little workaround where you can thicken the lines if you need to. But even just in the drawing stages, I found that in Procreate, there are certain brushes that I use now. And I try to always start with like the same size document. And then I know that like, I really like the mono line brush at 50% for my outlines. And if I kind of stick with that, and the sizing, then I can, I, I can get it pretty close. But there are some times where I will cut something. There is a bit of trial and error where I'll cut something out of vinyl and then I start weeding it, which is the process of going in and pulling out all the negative space that you don't want to use. And immediately I'll see that it's just too thin, that it's going to either snap over time or uh, it's just not going to read well. And so then I'll have to go back in and, and keep tweaking things. And it could take three or four times of actually cutting it and getting it to a physical object in front of me before I get it right, where it's, it's going to be in that sweet spot. Once you do that, can you use those templates again and again, or is it you use it once and then you've got to throw it away? I use them over again and again. There's some that I've had for, oh gosh, almost two years now and use them actively. <laughs> I, I was throwing them away for a while and then there was a workshop I was teaching and someone had asked if we could reuse them. And it was like, it never even crossed my mind. And yeah, I just rinse off any underglaze um, or glaze and stick them back onto the, they come on a, it comes on a roll, the adhesive back vinyl and the vinyl stuck to like a paper packing. And so I just save that and I stick it back on the paper backing after I wash it off and can use it over and over again. Man, that's so much more efficient than cutting paper. I used to cut paper, and man, my hands would hurt. It was a disaster. So I, I need to get a die cutter so that I can then <laughs> go back. I just abandoned that technique altogether. Yeah, I started hand cutting everything. I was using thin plastic sheets, anything I could find in the um, sort of office supply section. It could be like a plastic folder or those page protectors just trying all different gauges of plastic and I would use like a temporary adhesive and stick it, stick the plastic onto an image and then cut away all the negative with an exacto. And then I could pull the paper off of the plastic that had my image and I'd be left with the stencil, but Oh my gosh, it, it was tearing my hands up, putting all that pressure on my index finger, guiding the blade, and I remember thinking like there were, this was in 2015. So the die cutters, they were pretty new at this point, as far as like being accessible as a hobby tool. And I remember someone was like, you're cutting those by hand. You know, there's a machine, <laughs> but isn't it more noble as an artist to cut it with your hands and blood, sweat and tears. <laughs> and yeah, I was really resistant to it at first, but the more complex my stencils were getting, I was just like, okay, this is okay. I can do this. <laughs> I'll give myself permission. I'm glad you brought this up because one of the things I wanted to ask is if you think that labor is inherently valuable because your pots are amazingly complex in their visual surface. So that labor, do you think that it's valuable because you're expending it? Sometimes. It's tough. I, there were many years where I was putting plenty of work into the pots 
and and when you say value, I I think of it as monetizing. You know, do you monetize it? Um, is it worth it? Uh, is it necessarily? There were many years where it wasn't like I I saw the value in it, but I didn't feel like I was there yet. Where like I knew I was putting a lot into it, but I didn't feel like I could request that kind of compensation yet. Like it was just like I I it was a goal that someday my my time would be valued that way, but I sort of felt like it needed to grow to that and it would take time. And that sort of has been what happened. You know, I do have other artists who are starting out reaching out to me saying, you know, I have this really labor intensive process. I want to start selling my work. What do you charge? What can I charge? <laughs> And I don't, I don't have a perfect answer for it. I'm just like, yeah, you know, it took me a long time to build up to this. It was tough. It was a lot of hours, <laughs> but I do think that our time should be, it, it has to be of some value. I mean, it's finite. I feel like there could be times where maybe you're taking a really long time on a piece or personally, I'm taking a really long time on something, but like, maybe I'm not being as efficient I could be like oh this took forever but like I looked at my phone 17 times <laughs> you know <laughs> like I feel like if I'm really if I really go into the studio and and if I put eight hours into a piece and I am just like boogieing then yeah like I, I feel like yeah when I think about the value of that I'm I'm gonna think about all eight of those hours because <laughs> I know <laughs> like I was really engaged and really there. It's different. How much would, say, a mug cost? Right now, depending on the size and the complexity, they go between 150 and 195 And then how many hours does it take to decorate one? I have tracked it, which was sort of a weird process because everything's so broken up. But I would say simplest design probably has about five hours more complex designs, probably closer to six or seven. Because I'm trying to think about like rate per hour. When I talk to younger artists also, I, I try to explain like, well, you know, if you have a college degree, you've worked, you've paid, so you, you should tr pay yourself probably $20 an hour just as a starting line. And then you can build up from that. And I can just see in their brain, like it's almost some, <laughs> some of them look scared, like, oh no, I can't. I can't pay myself $20 an hour. I'm not worth that much. And then I'll talk to them a couple years later and I realize they have figured out they are worth more than $20 an hour. And even more than that, sometimes they've doubled or tripled that price <laughs> as you know, demand has gotten better because demand is also a part of this. I can spend a ton of time on pots and if no one wants to buy them, then it does not matter what I'm charging. Right. And that And that's where I started out. I was just like, I don't, I was doing a, a couple local shows, but no one, no one knew my work, you know, and to just show up with $200 mugs, <laughs> we'll be like, what is this? <laughs> yeah, it was, I had to build that, that audience for sure. But yeah, I think I, I figure if, if I make 30 mugs in a month, that's a good work pace. That means I'm I'm working probably 50 to 60 hour weeks, uh, hours a week, but not like killing myself, but not slacking off either. That's kind of, I just feel like every mug represents a day of my life. <laughs> it's kind of a weird thing to think about. <laughs> it's a beautiful sentiment in a way that at the end of the day, you have finished something concrete. Like I, I love that about pots that you can look back at your wear board and say, oh, I threw this many or I decorated this many. So I like that part. Yeah. And I mean, it is, everything's energy. Money is energy. The, the work we make is energy. And I don't know, like, I, I feel like that's kind of always why I've been more of a quality over quantity person. Like I want it. I want to remember the pieces. Like I love when I see a picture of something I made three years ago and I'm like, I remember making that piece. You know, it's, it wasn't just like, oh yeah, I think I made a bunch of those maybe I don't I don't know you know like I really like that and I feel like it transcends to the customers too because I 
swear they'll I will do like a local show and there'll be that thing that was the newest thing that I made. I am excited about it. Like it's just got that energy in it. And that'll be the first thing that people gravitate towards. I don't know what that is, but I've seen it enough times that, and even without having expressed it on social media publicly, like they just know, (laughs) they know when your soul is in it, it's kind of magic. Can you talk about creating demand? Because I know through Instagram, you promote the sales and through your newsletter, you've been able to create demand so much that you sell out pretty quickly, right? There's more customers than there are pots. Yeah, it's kind of a weird thing. <laughs> Honestly, it's kind of a pickle. I mean, it's a good pickle to be in, but the customer service people pleaser in me sees it as like, okay, how do I solve this? How do I get everybody a, a pot that wants one? And the way that I built it, honestly, I I started Instagram in 2015 and I would just share pictures of my work, I would think, you know, as I'm making and before I leave the studio, I think like what was going through my head today? What was, what was in front of me and what kind of story would that tell if I had to put it in an image? And I would snap, think about what that would be. I would snap a shot and and close up and then, you know, feedback happened naturally. And, and that was really nice um, to have that sort of full circle. And it was never coming from a place of wanting to sell. It was just wanting to share. And I didn't try to sell online much at all for a while. I would say three years now, I would only do one online sale in um, December. And it would be a small run of pots, maybe two dozen, 30 maximum. And, um, and that was it. That was the only time I tried to sell to the audience, or to my audience. Um, and so, yeah, it just happened really organically as far as the growth of my audience. I think my focus was always just on creating good pots, the best pots I could, (laughs) and creating the best content I could, thinking about the photo, thinking about the lighting, and the rest sort of followed. And I will say that with the pandemic, because my income was pretty diverse uh, leading up to that, I was teaching workshops, I was doing local festivals, it was a couple different streams of income that then went down to selling pots only. I had to start selling more directly online, um, which thankfully I had done those few shows. So it wasn't foreign to me, but um, I was really nervous because I had never, I guess, seen what the market would bear or what, like how much, how many people were really that interested in buying pots. It, It was just mind blowing honestly. And I think it, I think it has been really good for a lot of people just because through the pandemic, everybody was online. I have a friend in the tech industry who said that the pandemic essentially pushed just about 10 years into the future with technology and the way that we integrate with technology. Like it was kind of just a trial by fire. Like we just had to do it. And I thought that was really interesting perspective. And in some ways, I think that's true. Definitely. I can see that. I mean, I I think about that with my parents' generation. They were okay online, you know, like they were competent, I guess, online people, but now they are fluent. (laughs) You know, they can Zoom or FaceTime with my nieces and nephews, you know, like their, their internet skills got better because of the, the pandemic. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. And I really don't think it's going to go away. I think that there's, as far as online shopping goes, A lot of us have found that, you know, that we can connect with other makers um, and, you know, that there is definitely a strong desire for the handmade object and feeling that connection. I don't know, just everything's so digital that I think that being able to hold that, you know, I just, I think it's completely validated um, right now. And it's, it's such an exciting time to be a maker. Honestly, I graduated in 2009 and we didn't have Instagram yet. I think there were some like Facebook business accounts, but we didn't have all this. I'm just really grateful. There's so many fantastic resources that we can use now. There's two things that you do sales wise that I'm interested in talking more about. And one of them is the concept of pre-orders. Mm-hmm. And I think that can be 
a lot of people are sh- maybe shy away from pre-orders because they don't know their process well enough. But I think for you, like it seems like doing the pre-orders is a great way to have some guaranteed income in the future. And mm-hmm. then there's also this thing you do where you, well, I noticed in your shop, you sell pre-sale tickets. So that way people can buy the right to shop early. So can you talk about both of those things? I'll start with the, the early bird tickets so that they can uh, shop early. The demand was growing for my work through doing all, a lot of online sales throughout the year. So my process is normally I'm decorating for a month and a half. And then I go into bisking and glaze firing, but almost all of my work is done leather hard. So after bisque, it's pretty quick. So maybe like a month and a half of decorating and then two weeks of bisking, glazing, sometimes lustering. And so I'm sharing pictures of all my work in these greenware stages. And there's like a lot of time that I'm, I'm sharing the pots, but they're not available yet. And so people would get uh, interested in a certain piece and then they would reach out and say, can I just buy this from you now? And if I did that, I would probably not have very many pieces for my sale. And then anyone who didn't have the wherewithal to reach out, they would be shorthanded just because they didn't think of messaging me. And I just feel like that's not really fair. And so I would you know, tell people like, okay, no, like I have to reserve everything for the sale. And some people just don't have that very, very fast of internet. So if it does come down to who can click the fastest, if someone doesn't really have fast internet, then, then that puts them at a disadvantage. I don't know if I ever really learned the life isn't fair thing. Like I'm all <laughs> like, no, let's make it fair. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so I was trying to, you know, some people were like, oh, you could just sell a ticket and then like it goes to the purchase price of a piece. But if I did that, then it would be the same thing. It would just be uh, who can click the fastest to buy the ticket. Like there has to be some type of delineation between the ticket and the actual sale, you know, and, and rather than just raising my prices across the board, you know, it's like if someone's willing and that's the thing that allows them that time to shop without such a frenzy, which I do send out a newsletter with a preview of everything with photos, sizes, how many ounces, things hold, prices. I do that usually about three days before the sale so that everyone can see the work and know exactly what pieces they really like. Because if, if, everyone, if it was that frenzy of trying to check out and you didn't even get a chance to look at the description, that would be tough. So I do the early bird tickets. I'll typically base the number of tickets I sell on the number of pieces that I have. So if I had 40 pieces available, I'd probably sell about 10 tickets. So that way, even after the early birds have shopped, then there's still plenty of pieces left um, once it goes public and people don't feel like they, you know, don't have a good selection. If you were a corporation, I could see you selling like 200 early bird tickets for 30 pots. (laughs) (laughs) So I think that's nice that you're not. (laughs) Yeah, no kidding. And the pre-order. So I I kept finding myself in this place of, I would have, I have this rhythm of introducing new designs. So since I do all my design work on the iPad, that's typically something I'll do in the evenings while I'm doing social media stuff too. And it's really nice. You can work in bed. (laughs) (laughs) Also dangerous. (laughs) So I'll come up with new designs. And lately, it's been getting kind of crazy. On the iPad, it tells you how much time you've logged on a document. (laughs) Active working time. And some of these drawings are now getting to be almost 15 hours um, long. Yeah, but it's pretty cool to know. But it's so validating to me. It's like, this is why I prefer to work the way I work because if I were to do this drawing directly on a pot one time that would be so impractical and to be able to replicate you know there's just so I feel like there's so few things in pottery that we get to replicate compared to like drawing or photography where you can make prints so anything that sort of does that a little bit is exciting (laughs) 
have you ever thought about working with a special run factory, like something that would make essentially additions of the work, but you would be sending designs to them? Um, I know there are some high end factories in Korea that do this type of work. Have you thought about that? And, and is that something that you would be interested in ideologically? Yes. Apprehensively, I say yes. <laughs> um, Molly Hatch is a great example. And she actually did a, a course, an online course, like two years ago. And I took it um, and it was talking a lot about surface pattern design and licensing. And I find it really fascinating because I love the design process. I'd say I love it equally when I'm doing it digitally as much as I love it when I'm like actually doing it on a pot and seeing it come to fruition. So that's where like, I know I'll always make pottery. I know that I'll always want to maintain a studio practice, but realistically my time is finite and I can only make so much. And it's definitely something I'm interested in. There's a lot of legal stuff that I don't know about yet. I know that it, once you get contracts in place, you want to get a lawyer to look at it. And it's yeah, a little bit over my head still at the moment, but it's something I think about because I realize that with my time being finite and having to pay myself a livable wage, that the more complicated these things get, then there is a large group of people that can't afford it. And there's a level of accessibility that is created through that. Molly is, is a great example. She's figured out how to have the intimate part of creativity where she is in her studio working and drafting and making, but then she's figured out which parts of the process she can send out. And I remember giving a lecture probably five years ago about how in 10 years we were going to have more Molly hatches <laughs> because her method of working makes sense for the modern era. So we got five more years and then I'm going to check back in and see <laughs> if my uh, <laughs> prediction came true. It could very well be. I mean, I'm looking a little bit at drop shipping right now, like print on demand drop shipping. Like I really just, I think I might just start by doing something simple. I don't know if it would be ceramics though. Cause I don't want to be like, Hey, here are these mugs that I make and they're all handmade. And then here's the like mass produced version of it. Like, I don't think that that elevates the work, especially if I'm the one selling it. Like if it were a print on demand type thing where they could buy it through my site. Like, I think I just need to be very careful about what those objects are in relation to the work I make now. And it needs to further support the work rather than diminish it. Oh, that's, that's a great point. I, I think about your work in plastic, which I know is like a dirty word for ceramic <laughs> artists, but there's a way that you can print plastic or not print injection mold plastic that would work well for texture, basically when images become texture and vice versa. And I think that that can be nice. I mean, plastics come with a huge downside of toxicity and all of that stuff. So I'm not saying it's the best option, but I could see <laughs> these patterns becoming a very thin plate, you know, that, that people use, or like Molly made some great paper plate designs that were printed. And I was walking through target one day and I was like, Hey, I know that drawing. And I thought that that was really cool to see her work take that form. Yeah. I mean, there's just, there's so much out there. And I love design and I love objects. Yeah, I just, I, I definitely want to be careful about the, des the type of the designs that I put out there, the type of objects I put them on, and then how those objects are produced. Like one thing I was thinking about would be like a cell phone case, because I, I recently got a new to me cell phone. And I was looking at all the cases and I'm looking at botanicals and florals. And I'm like, I don't, I don't like any of these. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make my own, you know, that was kind of the beginning of it. It's just, I want to make my own with the plants that I love. And I just feel like a lot of times I'll see florals that are representing a certain flower, a certain plant. And they like, do they just miss the mark of like capturing like the key elements that make this plant what it is? <laughs> I don't know why that is. And, it, and I might just be, be being like critical, but I'm just like, oh, it's just so close. But, <laughs> and that's where I started was I want to make a cell phone case. And, and there's some great ones out there that are biodegradable. Oh, nice. Which is fun. 
So, you know, and it's one of those things like it's a, it's a, like a surface that can become a canvas or even like a shower curtain. And I know it's funny, like these are kind of mundane objects, but this is the world we live in, you know, and these are the places where art can integrate into our lives. I wanted to wrap up thinking about the way you use color and how you get to your understanding of color. So I was reading a blog post that someone had written about your work and they had an image of your test tiles and you have these amazing test tiles, or at least you did at the time that the post came out that were so organized. Like it looked like it was like a scientific experiment into color theory. So can you talk about using a testing method to understand color? Yeah, it's funny when I when I started working with underglazes, my na- I very naively believed that I was going to keep things simple <laughs> and easy by using commercial underglazes, <laughs> and that I wasn't going to get involved in the chemistry, which is really funny because it's actually in some ways more challenging because you don't know the chemistry that's in there. So when something goes sideways, you don't know why, uh, or you have to backward engineer it to figure out why. I would say the number one thing is just anytime I get a new color, I will roll out a little slab of clay, you know, use a cookie cutter so that it will match all the other ones. And I will do one, two, and three coats of this new, whether it be an underglaze or a glaze. And I use I do that on my clay body, which is a dark clay body. So that changes things quite a bit. And I go mid range, so cone five. So some colors do burn out at that temperature. And it's just, you know, it's a great way to start. Let me see how translucent this color is, how pigmented it is, what it does on a dark surface, and what it does at my temperature. And from there, once I have that information, I mean, sometimes colors just don't make it past that stage. I see what they do in the kiln and I don't like it. And then it goes on the shelf for a while. And sometimes it gets resurrected because I learn how to mix it with another color that sort of like does something really special and saves whatever qualities I didn't like about it. But I just, I come at it from this angle of show me what you want to do in the kiln. Like I don't have expectations. I mean, I bought you color (laughs) because I thought you were going to look this way, but like, like, let's just start real simple um, with what I want, like just see what it wants to do. And so from there um, I will then have all these tiles that just show me these individual colors. And then I can grab, Groupings of three, typically I do three. Two seems like too little, four can get complicated. And then I start playing and making palettes that I think would look good together. And it's really intuitive. Sometimes I'll see something either in person or even online, see an image that I really love and go, wow, what is it about this I love? Oh, wow, there's this is a really unexpected color palette. Hmm, what underglazes do I have that would do that? And so it comes from different ways when I create these color palettes of three. And then I will take those three and I will make another tile and those tiles will be larger. So if I have three colors, um, I'll do three horizontal bands. So color A, B, C in horizontal bands and then intersecting that going vertically, I'll do those same three colors again. And what that does is it shows me what of those three colors, what all of them look like above and below one another, because that can make a huge difference. Like if you're using purple and orange, I found that I like purple on top of orange, the way that the orange peeks through, but orange on top of purple turns muddy. Like just these little subtle differences that like when you're layering colors, you can take two colors that mix together would turn brown and you can layer them and get this completely different result. When it comes to layering, that's how I set up my test tiles. And then that will indicate to me the order in which I wanna layer them. So that if purple on top of orange looks good, then I know that the orange is gonna go, go down first and then I'll do purple on top. You know, it's just amazing how three colors, if you change the order of them and did, I don't know, six different pots, they would all read completely differently even with just the same three colors. Yeah. And when I look at your work, one of the things I love is the way you photograph it. You're often using a complementary color or a adjacent color to make the photo pop, you know, so there's a lot of action in the pot itself, but then there's also a lot of action in the photography. 
you were the first person I think I saw that really dedicated to the multi or not multicolored, but a different than white or different than gradiated backdrop. How did you figure that out that like, Hey, I can photograph this in a way that punches the whole thing up even more. When I do my professional shots for the internet, for my website, I'll do white, but for Instagram, when I was taking that, that online course with Molly Hatch, they were talking about, you know, branding was a topic and creating like a cohesive aesthetic. And I remember reading somewhere once that when you look at your Instagram feed in the grid view, that like it should be cohesive and it should almost feel like a magazine or something. And I remember looking at mine thinking, oh my gosh, <laughs> it's just a jumble. And I really just could not figure it out. I was like, and I had even asked when I was in that course, like, what do you think I should do to, cause we could link our Instagram and then like give each other feedback. I was like, what do you think I should do? And I think they had said that it was Molly and um, someone else. I think her name is Daisha. And they were like, oh, well, maybe if you, you know, focus on, okay, for this week, I'm going to do all posts of like my, this color palette of pot. So all my blue ones. And then the next week, maybe I'll do all my orange palettes. I was just like, oh, I don't, you know, the backgrounds are always varying. That constitutes at least 50% of the photo, the background. So um, I was talking with Eric Bopmull of Companion Gallery. And he was like, yeah, I just want to paint some uh, some pieces of drywall and just have them around. And I was like, can I use that? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, go for it. I haven't done it yet, you know? And that's what I did. I went to a uh, you know, local hardware store and they have two foot by two foot panels of drywall and they call it a patch. It's like, just, you know, if you need a little bit and, and you could buy a full sheet and break it down, but this was nice because it was just like clean and ready to go. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't as, uh, economical, but it was just perfect. And so I grabbed a few of those and then I went to the paint section and I found little swatches, brought them back, compared them with my pots. And uh, then you can get a sample size of paint for like three bucks mixed up. And then I just painted the drywall. And so I have backdrops that then like can correspond with the different pots. It's really nice now that I've been doing it for like a year and a half because you can just like scroll and it's just, it really gives that overall aesthetic but yeah, it was, it was so simple, honestly, and it, it really just helps tie things together. The work looks amazing on those colors. And I, I just recently discovered what you were talking about, like those small pieces of, dr of drywall and painted them myself. And I realized that I put, I put this really dark blue, but it, it was too glossy. It was putting off too much light coming back to the camera. So every mm. single time I would shoot it, it would come out really differently. So I'm now realizing that like paint, like, oh yeah, right. I can pick any paint and any surface. It could be satin or eggshell, whatever the, the one that's not going to reflect light back. So I hope people do check out the Instagram. It's, it's beautiful. You could teach a design course on your Instagram feed. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I don't know. I'm just, I, I'm honestly just figuring things out as I go. It's been fun. I, take notes, I guess, mental notes. When I see something, I'm like, why is that working? You know, how could I, how could I make that work for me? I mean, anytime I see someone, uh, whether they be a potter or just an artist or anything really succeeding on, on social media platforms, I just see it as opportunity. You know, what are they, what are they doing? That's working. What could I learn from this? It's such a, such a wonderful tool. I'm, I'm really a, a big advocate for it. Well, to wrap up, can you plug the Instagram feed and then also your website so that people know where to shop? So my, my Instagram handle is Renee, R-E-N-E-E, -E -E, underscore Lopresti, L-O-P-R-E-S-T-I. And then my website is ReneeLopresteCeramics.com. Well, thanks so much. It was good to meet you and it was a pleasure to chat. Likewise, Ben. Thank you. I'd like to thank Renee for taking the time to do this interview. It was nice to meet her after being a fan of her work for many years. I'll be back next week with another episode. Thank you guys for tuning in.
If you'd like more information on the artists on the show, or if you'd like more information about the workshops and events that I'll be having in the next couple months, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under Carter Pottery. Another great way to support the show is to leave me a comment on iTunes. To do that, search Tales of a Red Clay Rambler under iTunes Podcasts, and you'll find a page that's linked to our show. Thank you guys for the support. <laughs>